We'll go back to Diane. What we've got is the sound going into the ears. We put the emerald on first of all. Then I put the headphones on. Then she goes weak. Okay, what we found is that, what Jill found is that lemon balm, if you got the lemon balm, was the herb which negated the toxic, uh, toxic metals and chemicals, wasn't it? Yeah. So we won't go into working the dose on that at the moment, but you're familiar with how to do that. And what we find now is she's in strength. Okay? So now what we know there's still nutrition and hypoxia, isn't there? Yeah. So what we do now is we take the eyes to the left and up three or four times. Remember, that's called habituation neurologically. Right? And that just indicates in the nutrition aspect we haven't cleared that. Okay? Because she goes weak when we go back into that eye position. So now we'll have a look at the composites and find out what nutrients she's deficient in. So we'll do... Uh, Mm, minerals. minerals. Yeah. No. Amino acids. Amino acids. Sometimes people do show amino acids, but it's not often on their own. Vitamins. Vitamins. These are more the single unactivated vitamins. Coenzymes. Coenzymes, which are the activated vitamins. Saccharides. Yeah, saccharides, they don't really show too often. Probiotics, very important, of course, for the guts. Paul? Unsaturated fatty acids. Unsaturated fatty acids. Yes. Okay, so now we go for saturates. Shall we as well? yeah. Okay, never forget saturates. Why, why do we test for saturated oils? Because these are antifungal and antimicrobial, aren't they? They're the sort of C8 caprylics up to about C14 saturates, which would be myristic. So if a person strengthened to a saturate, tend to suspect funguses. And there's one other little sa saturate in there which comes up sometimes in addition to coconut oil, which is hardly ever um, castor bean oil, but usually it's a coconut oil. But vitamin A is a saturate as well, and it has very wonderful um, integrity prob uh, properties for epithelial tissue, in other words, all the respiratory passages and things, and has very powerful, as a result of that, antifungal effects. So vitamin A improves the integrity of the mucous membranes, so stops fungal spores from attaching in the same way. So vitamin A tends to come up sometimes, but we've got an unsaturate. So she's tall, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she's probably green. So let's have a look at some green oils. Let's just go through, let's do the green oil mix first of all, shall we? So the green oil mix is the old um, wonder oil, the peanut and the sesame, uh, with hazelnut and grapeseed oils. Yep, I'm just looking for a product kit one. Is that that one? Is that the blues? Here, yeah. here's the green, uh, green wonder oils. Okay, so we put the green wonder oil on, and she strengthens very nicely. Now, my next question is, is that the best oil? Is that the best product for her? Okay. Does she need a single oil or with the multiple combination or is there something missing in there? So I have three criteria to know whether it's the best thing. I go to, first of all, conception versus all 20, 20, we call it 22, but you call it 21. Is it 21? I know I was one out. <laughs> okay. So she remains nice and strong. That's good. Okay. Then I go for the GV20 on the top there, that's for the hypothalamus. CV21 is more for the corpus callosum. It saves me having to test the other brain on the other side, that's all. GV20, she's strong. And then I go to GV28 with the tongue, which is on the roof of your mouth. Go back to the soft palate, come forward about a centimetre, and you should be right on what we call the cruciate suture. And she stays strong to that. So that's a good remedy. Okay? If she'd weakened on any of those criteria, then it wouldn't have been the best remedy. So you may need to look for another. So she's fine there. So that's, let's just double check there's nothing else in the nutrition field. So she stays strong to the eyes to the left and up. She does. But there's one other direction, wasn't there? Okay, hypoxia. So let's test her there. So we haven't completed the job yet. So let's have a look at hypoxia. So now we go through the nutritional uh, composites again. Okay, because anything can cause hypoxia. 
Obviously, the first thing you tend to think about is iron, the different forms of B12, folic acids, and so on. But so these are ways to do the composites. Minerals. So minerals, pull. Now, interesting because now minerals show up. Okay, so we we'll do we we'll go through the other ones just to see that there's nothing else. Vitamins. Vitamins. But you're already thinking to yourself, what minerals no, could do this? And obviously, iron is the first thing you'd think about. But what regulates the heart? And what did we see with Diane? Is a very poor first sound, wasn't it? What do we what do we found already is oils. This is to get the calcium into the cell membranes of the cardiac tissue itself. So these are the essential fatty acids that she needs. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So let's go for the major minerals then. So the major minerals we're going to go for is iron. So give me iron first. <coughs> now, occasionally iron comes up, but they put iron into so many other things that it's unlikely. So let's go now for the for the big boys. Don't go for boron and chromium and molybdenum and these sort of things first of all. Let's go for the big boys. Magnesium. So let's see if magnesium is on. Most of the people are magnesium. Okay, We'll just put zinc on to see if there's anything else. Magnesium, zinc. So all over the world, magnesium, zinc. It's everywhere. And the major reason for this is intensive farming. With intensive farming and the use of phosphates and nitrates, it just drains out these elements. And magnesium is not a trace element. It's a macro, it's an electrolyte. It's vital for the whole composition of calcium. Give me calcium. Okay, so let's see if she's actually getting calcium in. She needs to get calcium in, and to get it in, we need the essential fatty acids, which we've shown. Um, and you need P5P, as we know but she doesn't strengthen to calcium, okay? So we can put calcium away at the moment, okay? What she does is she strengthens to magnesium. Now, we have a number of different magnesium products. Um, we have the liquid magnesium, which is a mixture of sulfates and chlorides, and we have the new smart range of minerals, or selected minerals, which have food compounds in addition to the sulfates and chlorides, which have organically bound magnesium or the mineral within the actual food itself. And the food that is richest in magnesium over and above green vegetables is buckwheat. Buckwheat is a wonderful uh, grain, um, although it's not technically a grain in the sense of uh, a cereal crop, but it's very, very rich in magnesium. So by making 50% of our compound as buckwheat, and the remaining is the sulfate and chloride, it works really well. <coughs> and uh, we need that. So you've got the, s the smart one, it's called. Yeah. OK, so let's take off the uh, magnesium. Uh, I got the so wonder oil. Find the one, that's the lemon balm. So we've got the emerald. So let's put on there the, line them all up there. OK, so let's put on the smart magnesium. And I'm going to just touch here on CV21 for speed, GV20. And then you're going to do your tongue on the roof of your mouth. So the smart one works really well, um, as does the liquid one. So we can use either. So let's just leave that one on now. And let's just recheck that there's nothing else in the hypoxic field. OK, now the question is, where do we go now? Do we send her home? So yes, we could. Running. Send her home running. OK. <laughs> Well, you will be with the magnesium by the time you've got your magnesium up. That's going to get that first heart, get the calcium regulated into the muscle tissue. The oil is going to allow the calcium to get in and improve the integrity there. And the, yara, uh, the white lemon balm is going to get rid of the junk that's accumulated. Okay. Now, let's go back. Did we do the... We didn't do the emotional points with it. Okay. So let's go now to the right, greater wing of the sphenoid, and the left. Now, when we test the subconscious emotions, as Jill said, we're looking really at the amygdala, the limbic system. So on the right, we, the nearest place you can get to the amygdala is on the greater wing of the sphenoid. So we're comparing the right amygdala to the left. So it's right to left. Okay? So we're seeing if that combination makes any difference to her. No, because she's in strength already, isn't she? Because okay? we fixed the chemistry. Now we go left to right. OK, so we're looking and comparing left brain to the right brain, right brain to the left brain. Now, so subconscious 
And let's make sure we understand that the limbic system is the subconscious. So the subconscious is the memory and the inherited characteristics which we've inherited from our genetics, from our forefathers, <coughs> forebearers. And every single thing that you've ever seen, tasted, touched, smelt or felt, okay, is recorded, whether you like it or not. Because under hypnosis it can all be brought back. So never forget that. Even you may consciously not have remembered or seen it, under hypnosis it will come back. So everything you've ever experienced. Now the reason for this is you build an enormous database. Okay. Now on the assumption that Diane was well once. Okay? In other words, she was at her best once, okay? Once upon a time, before this dreadful illness took over you. I'm only joking, okay, all right? So what was the difference when she was feeling really well as opposed to, let's say, what she's now? In other words, there's something wrong, isn't there? There's something missing that her brain can't make the connection. So we're missing something, either information going into the brain from the afferents or something from the efferents going back out. So how does your computer make decisions? It calls upon its database, doesn't it? So she has to call upon her database to say, I want to make corrections. All right? But if there's a blockage in there some way, and the thing is with her neurological system, the blockage is she's deficient in magnesium, the oils, and she's a bit toxic, so no wonder she's clogged up. All right? So what we found is the subconscious, in other words, the memory, we're two people, really. We're two minds. We've got a living entity called the conscious mind where we do our positive thinking or we do our thinking, let's say, executive centers making decisions, and we've got our subconscious, which is our memory. Now, psychologists tell us 95% of the time we work subconsciously. So most of the time we sit there dreaming about all sorts of things uncontrollably. So you're thinking about this, that, the other, and this little voice is chattering away to you during the day, and it chatters away to you at night time when you're asleep, called a dream. Okay? But most of the day we dream as well, we daydream. Okay? And we do our things, everything in life, subconsciously. Apart from what psychologists say, about 5% of the time we actually think. Which is dreadful really, only 5% of the time. And unfortunately, 75% of that 5% we actually use our brains is negative. Okay, we think about negative things. We're not positive out there, okay, which is what we should be. We should at least get at 50% of our thoughts should be positive with a bit of luck, so it can bring us up into the higher realms. So with Diane, we've said at the moment her subconscious doesn't seem to react at all. So let's now go to the emotional stress reflexes, which are just between the eyebrow and the... Uh, um, the eminences on the frontal. Now I use the point halfway between those two rather than the eminences themselves because that's where the orbital frontal part of the frontal lobe is. And this is the thinking part. This is the bit where we make decisions. Okay? Now this is where we, our mind, our conscious mind, works through. It doesn't necessarily mean that's where it is, but that's the medium that it works through. That's the measuring device. Where. So what we've done again is we compare right to left. Okay, so we're looking for conflict between the right brain and the left. Remember, as you know, the left brain is the logical one, the right brain is the more intuitive one. So, again, no problem right to left. So we now go left to right. So now she completely flakes out. So where is her problem coming from? In her mind. Okay, dreadful thought, really. But she's creating her problem which is then changing our chemistry. Okay? Now we've come from the chemistry, we've come a long way, we might have dealt with the structure, we've dealt with toxins, we've dealt with deficiencies, but in the end we've come back, unfortunately, to where the causation probably is. So what are we going to do about this? Send her for two years of counselling, I suggest. Okay? Or we could tap her, or we could do flower essences, or we could do affirmations. There's lots of things we can do. Uh, and we can verbalize what these approaches might do because we don't know whether they're going to be effective or not. And you probably have your own favorites. But there are certain ones which work very well from clinical experience. And we're working on biofeedback systems. We'll work very well with this. But the most powerful that we found and consistent is the smell. Now you know, and I've handed this around, each of you have smelled half of the kit. Okay? 
what we were going to do is send them around without any labels on and see how many people could get them right. <laughs> okay, of the 40 that we sent around. So you had 20 and you had about 20 as well. And I asked a few people which one they like, and they said, oh, I like that one. And I said, it's really strange because usually the one that comes up for you is one that you like. Okay? It's unlikely a remedy will come up and a remedy which you don't like. Okay? Now you know, if you've got a dog, that a dog will smell. It works primarily by smell because it doesn't see when it's born for a certain two weeks or something. But it uses its nose to find the nipples of the mother by the smell of the milk. So for a dog, smell is really important. And it's more important than vision. A dog can hair out, but it doesn't mind about what it sees. It hardly sees anything at night time, but it smells. It smells the fox when it's around my house or your house and on its way, and boom, out it goes. And it likes certain smells, but other smells, if you watch the dog, the tail stops or the tail goes up and the hackle goes up, you know. So they smell fear, they smell danger. Uh, but at the same time, if they smell something nice, they wag their tail and they're very happy, like a nice piece of fox poo. They love it. And you straight into that and roll around that and bring it indoors. It's their favorite. Now, some of you said, oh, I liked oregano. One person over there said oregano was my favorite. Along here, they all turn their nose up at oregano. So it's lucky we don't all like the same thing and we don't all dislike the same thing. But something happens to our whole emotional neurological centers, the highest parts of us, when we have a smell which we like. And I think we picked out a few, didn't we? We said, oh, that one is really, really nice. But luckily, somebody else will say, well, actually, I don't like that one. Otherwise, we'd all show it to the same remedy. So let's see with Diane wh what she is. So what we've done so far is we've done composites. Now, we don't know that this is going to universally work. So we've divided it into what we call herbies. Fennel. Yes. What? Fennel. You can have whatever shows up. <laughs> she's, she's wanting fennel. <laughs> but we're... Uh, you're going to have cloves then. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're going to put herbs or herbies on. No, she doesn't strengthen the herbies. Tree. So trees, <coughs> woodies, woodies they're called. Trees. Okay. Flowers. Flowers. You look more like a flower. Oh. No. Flower. Okay. Fruit. Fruit. Maybe you're a fruity. Yes. Now, as Jill said, there are lots of fruits around. Um, and strangely, there's no very few fruits which are indigenous, which are aromatherapy oils in this country. Juniper and myrtle are the main ones there. And, uh, you know, you think there would be apple and pear and cherry and so on, but there aren't. Um, but there's plenty of citrus, plenty of oranges, limes, grapefruit, but they're not indigenous to here. But they may come up, but what we want to do is concentrate on the indigenous aromatherapies, first of all rather than go straight down to the Brazilian jungle or somewhere and get something obscure out. We want to see if there's is a homegrown one. So let's try juniper. No, so myrtle. Myrtle is otherwise known as bilberry, of course, and this is excellent. Okay, so is it the right one? Yes, she says, it is the right one. So GV is strengthened, so it's the right one. But let's make sure, let's go to CV 22, uh, 21. That just saves me having to swap on the other side. Let's go GV20. Okay, and tongue on the roof of your mouth. Yes. Okay, so what we will do now is we'll make up a VEP spray. So all you've got to do now, Jill, is find out in that box <laughs> where the juniper's gone. So I think the box is, uh, um, is, it, is it back there still? Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll make the VEP spray and we'll show you how to use it. Okay, you're done at the moment. Come back and see us a bit later. Oh, just while we're there still, remember in the clear, in other words, with nothing else on her, she showed up to the SA node. So touch on there. Okay, remember, although she got a regular heart at present, she did have a positive when it came to the SA node, in other words, the pacemaker. So let's see out of these which one has an effect on her, okay, on the pacemaker. So lemon balm, remember this was for chemicals and toxic metals? Yes. So you could say that lemon balm helps her pacemaker, okay? And I would concur that that is right, because if there's toxic metals, you don't want toxic metals in that pacemaker, do you? 
uh, not the emerald. So let's go for um, myrtle. Now let's do that one last because that's the emotion. Uh, and green wonder oil. In other words, the omega oils in there. Yes, help the pacemaker. And magnesium, smart magnesium, helps the pacemaker. So they all work. Right? So everything works. It's holographic, isn't it? The body's holographic. So when you find one part that you can work from, work from it. Okay? So with a person with cardiac problems or wants to improve their performance, the heart is the best place to work from. Okay? If they come in with a gut problem, you may not do the heart. You may work off the gut, first of all. But now let's try the myrtle. So this is just the aromatherapy. This is not the herb itself. This is the aromatherapy. And see how it affects the heart? So why does it affect the heart? Okay. Why, in other words, the emotion. Why does the emotion affect the heart? Because the heart sends information to the brain, and the brain sends information to the heart. Okay. And we know that she has an emotional problem. Are you all right with all this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So if we're going to finish the job off, finish your how's the spray done sprays there okay so let's go back to just where we were okay now you go back um, I'm going to just pile this lot on you except the myrtle okay now what is the emotion this is the question what is the emotion that's worrying her so we want to find out what the emotion is <coughs> That is, we call it a negative emotion. Okay? Freud called it an unconscious emotion, which means it's a conscious emotion, but it's beyond the field of our awareness. So it's not like a linear dimension. It's beyond our field of awareness. So we don't see it or experience it. Remember, we only consciously work 5% of the time. And we don't know who we are. <laughs> if we only think 5% of the time, who the hell are we? Where are we coming from? Where's that mind, that conscious mind of yours, really coming from? Anybody have an idea? You know, which remedy showed up for you? Which was the one that smelt nice to you is often the one that is the one that you need of all those properties and qualities that Jill talked about. Which one did you think was horrible? That might be significant as well. So let's, rather than say an unconscious motion, because that appears that it, it's not conscious. This is a conscious, but you're not aware that you're doing it, not aware where you're coming from. So let's say that the uh, unconscious emotion, negative emotion of where you're coming from that's causing disharmony or non-coherence between your left and your right brain and your thinking, conscious thinking, is shame and humiliation, is guilt and blame, is apathy and despair, is grief and regret, okay, is anxiety and fear, is craving and desire, is anger, is pride or hurt pride. Okay, so I've been through the basic eight unconscious or negative emotions that David Hawkins taught and we've used for many years there. And that emotion is anxiety and fear. Okay, now how can I confirm that that is the case? I go to the meridian associated with that and, w and she's got all the things on now, okay but we haven't fixed, I haven't put the myrtle on, right? So the final bit, if you like, here is to go to the kidney meridian. Okay, so the kidney meridian is where she's coming from. That's where the sole source of your problem is, <coughs> is your kidney meridian. Yeah. Okay. Now the kidney meridian, let's take these off. So it's anxiety. She expresses it. She doesn't necessarily know, because remember, it's beyond her field of mind. She doesn't necessarily know that in her life, right the way through her life, what she's doing is, is expressing her underlying fears and anxieties in everything that she does in there. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Yes. Spot okay. On. What? Spot on. Kidney. You, you all know the, the muscles associated with the kidney, but do you know the organs associated with the kidney apart from the kidney? <laughs> Right? At the heart? Adrenals, yeah. The ears, yes, yes, the ears. And, and the eyes, but the ears. Okay, now let's do a lifty little trick, which we might have started from right at the beginning. So let's pop our fingers, just that finger, in your right ear, actually in your ear, 
and now we do it with the left ear. So let's see what happens when we compare the right ear to the left. Nothing. Now you do the left ear to the right ear. Okay, so hear no evil. <laughs> so this is where the problem is, is in, in the hearing, in the kidney meridian. The kidney meridian really, or the ears if you like, when the ears show up like that, it represents the genitor urinary system. And that's the kidney, the bladder, the prostate in the males, everything to do with the urinary system, or water, if you like, water balance entirely in there. So that'll be always will be your problem, will be water. Okay? So fear and anxiety is where she's coming from. It's a water meridian, is it? A water element. And that's what the myrtle will fix up for you. Right. All right? So spray her now. <laughs> okay, come and sit and let's stand back for a spraying. Um, even if she didn't take the yarrow or anything else at this stage, as long as she has a spray, she's all right. Okay. Um, but, obviously, she's still going to be magnesium deficient. So she needs some magnesium. She needs her uh, lemon balm to detoxify. Um, but she's going to need her myrtle. And don't you need to find out the specific metal? Well, y yes. She's a green. Uh, you know, I would, how I would have started, Sam, is in the standard way and started with the colours, etc. Found out what body type she is. I think she's green, I think she's still green because she didn't show the subconscious emotions at all. Um, so I don't think she, you know, there's any reason for that. But it could be that the metal could be nickel being a green person. Yeah. But what is important is to get it out yeah. Yeah, and detox her. Because in my opinion, that metal is having a little bit of a negative effect on her SA node. And that's really quite significant. So when people get problems with their pacemakers, don't just say, oh, you know, go on the drugs, have a new pacemaker. Say, why? And this is asked why it is. And the answer is always the same. It's a person's deficient, they're toxic, and they've got structural mechanical problems, it's something that they're eating, it's an infection, it's lack of oxygen, etc. It's the same answer to all problems. Why has she got a problem now which she didn't have 20 years ago? The answer is because something's missing. Okay, she can't get the brain can't make the communication. It, on, a, on a scale of 100%, you know, 100% being the best that, when you, that you've ever been, all right? Where would you put yourself right now if 100% is the best you've ever been? 70. 70, okay. And how old were you or how long ago were you when you were 100%, do you reckon? Well, you must have been 100% for you, wasn't you? 30s, yeah, okay. So, there we have the, the difference. So between now and when she was in her 30s, she's dropped. So you could probably predict another 10 years, she won't be 70%, well, she, she'll be much lower than that. Um, you know, as she gets older, she'll get more clogged up with the toxins, more deficient as far as the magnesium. But it's not too late. She can stand in and epigenetically, in other words, she can change this genetic effect by simply doing the things that we suggest. One of those is to detoxify, and the best detoxifier at the moment is lemon balm, which is a wonderful and clears the mind and everything else. Magnesium will aid your heart and get your heart to work better there, and get the calcium in so the first beat will come up. That'll improve your hypoxia. And the oils will get the cell membranes up and the brain working and everything else. And the myrtle will give you all the characteristics that Jill's talked about. Yeah, love, and forgiveness. love and forgiveness. which is uh, noble things, noble things indeed. So thank you, Diane, for the use of your body and mind. So I'm going to just uh, go back to make sure where we left off, we understand where we're going. So we did innovation. So basically where I left off is all to do with the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So all those heart blocks, flutters, um, paroxysmal tachycardia are all involved with changes of the, the brake and the accelerator or the pacemakers themselves. So now what you want to do quite easy, 
you can determine if the heart rate is fast, it's probably a sympathetic overload, or a lack of the brake, okay? and vice versa. So if the heart is slow, it's too much vagus, or a lack of sympathetic tone on there. Okay? So we know that the SA node is the prime regulator, and both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic go into there. Okay? It's debatable whether the sympathetic goes into the AV node. Okay? And it's also debatable with the vagus whether the left one sp slows the heart down or slows the contraction down and the right. Different neurologists I've spoken tell you something different, so I don't want to get down that road and say the left one is involved with the heart rate. That seems to be the general thing, and the right one is involved with the intensity of the heart contraction. That's the way I've understood it, but other people tell me no, it's around the other way. I have one simple answer to that, and that's to therapy localize it um, on the uh, foramen there, just behind the mastoid. So if you find the mastoid on yourself there, go on the little suture there, the occipital mastoid suture, back as far as you can, and you'll get then to the foramen where the vagus nerve comes out. Okay. Right? Yeah. Oh, the ovale. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And that's the nearest place that we can get to therapy localized. So if you have, say, a um, suspect that with the, say, the S SA node shows up, and a positive therapy goes, just the therapy localized on both sides, one at a time, and see if the vagus is involved with it. Okay? And if you get a thoracic, which would be probably T2, 3, 4, 5 area, if that makes a difference, then you know there's probably a sympathetic chain reaction in it. Okay. So just uh, before we go to coffee, um, let's go and have a look at uh, um, coronary disease. Coronary is generally considered to be the big one. So most of the other heart problems can debilitate us, but they don't usually kill us. The only ones that really kill us are heart coronary myocardial infections, uh, infarctions, and aneurysms. Okay, so those two are the real, real bad ones, nasty boys. So coronary disease, one characteristic, and the result of using devitalized foods. So this would be the white flower disease or problem. So anybody from Tameside? Tameside, there are staggering inequalities in deaths from heart disease in different parts of the UK, says a heart charity the British Heart Foundation, they're the main ones there. And Tameside in Greater Manchester had the highest death rate of 132 per 100,000 people, three times higher than Kensington and Chelsea. Okay. Question is why, isn't it? Uh, in London, different mayors, I suppose. <laughs> uh, Money in Northern Ireland and Glasgow had the second, is that right, Ballymoney? Oh, that's where you come from, okay. Yes, thank you, Kevin, you're out. You live in Kensington now, do you? Yeah, you want to move. You want to get everybody out of Manchester and move them into, all into Kensington. Had the second and third highest death rates. Now, there's theories with Manchester has soft water. And down in the south, we have hard water because we've got lots of chalk and things in there. And it has been shown that in hard water areas, there's less heart disease in comparison than heart attacks. And the interesting thing with that is it's not calcium, because they thought, oh, high calcium, low calcium was the problem. In Manchester, the water is very soft. You get the shampoo out and you've got bubbles everywhere. It's just that calcium always goes with magnesium in water. And when you have low calcium, you have low magnesium. Okay? And when you have high calcium, you have high magnesium. And it's the magnesium which is the beneficial part, because people do use magnesium, ionic magnesium, they use it from their water. There's undoubted evidence that minerals in water are taken up for our use. And the more minerals there are in the water, the more we take them up. And we use water as a source of our minerals. So using distilled water can be great because you don't get any toxins, but you also don't get those minerals. Now you may only get two or three percent of your minerals from your water, from your mineral water if you like. But every day you take distilled, you're getting two or three percent less. So if you take distilled water over a period of time, you basically, you don't leach out, you just don't get your mineral levels in, okay? So you do need mineral water, but you need mineral water which has got plenty of magnesium. 
and we try and persuade people to get as near as they can to equal proportions. Certainly not greater than two to one. Two of calcium to one of magnesium. Ideally, this, the tighter you can get that, the better. If you can get one and a half, or even one to one, is even best. That's probably best. So this is interesting because it may be to do with the soft and the hard water, maybe other reasons. People in, believe me, probably people in Chelsea and Kensington have as many stresses as people in Manchester. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's to do with the stress situation. It's probably more to do with perhaps diet um, and, uh, and water. Now, coronary heart disease is the leading cause of death in the Western world, in spite of all the emphasis laid on cholesterol, triglyceride and weight management. Dr. Morgan in the University of California put a group of dogs, and, and this is quite um, important, this was some years ago, uh, Dr. Morgan put a group of dogs on a diet of white flour enriched with synthetic vitamins and compared their behaviour with another group fed on the same white flour which wasn't enriched. The surprising result was that dogs on the enriched flour died first and tended to die after their actions became that of a sedate senility by sudden death failure. Dr. Morden concluded that the addition of the synthetic vitamins to the flour increased the demand for some of the unknown factors in the diet which as a consequence became actually deficient sooner than with the diet with the non-enriched flour. These unknown factors could therefore quite appropriately be called heart protective group. The main one of this undoubtedly is vitamin E. Vitamin E, remember I talked briefly this morning, lack of defi deficiency of vitamin E causes cardiac muscle necrosis, in other words the heart can burst. Vitamin E is only present in fresh grain. So if you freshly mill your grain, you'll get your vitamin E. If you leave that flour for between a week and four weeks, gradually the E will get used up as an antioxidant to the wheat germ oil. So the, germ, the oil which is present in the wheat germ needs the vitamin E to act as an antioxidant to protect it. And between one and four weeks, it'll gradually get used up. So at the end of four weeks, what will happen is there'll be no vitamin E in there, and if you've got a whole grain flour, it'll start to go rancid. Okay? And when it goes rancid, it's bad for you because you're taking in rancid oils, and we mentioned about rancid oils with the heart. So this proves the fact yet again that white bread is better than brown bread. Okay? But freshly milled and made brown bread, whole grain bread, is the best. Okay? Did we get those breads? Um, You've only got your one. Okay, now, I want somebody who is allergic, if you like, or intolerant to grain, to wheat. Okay, you are. Okay, you are? You can't tolerate it at all? A little bit. A little bit. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's try you up on here. So you, you come up on here. What colour are you? What's your... Red. You're red, yeah. So reds are the people we're really after, aren't they? Because they're the ones who are sensitive to the wheat. So let's pop you down there. And what we need is, um, have we got a, um, some other form of wheat? So if I can have the wheat there, the bread. Oh yeah. It's got butter on it. <laughs> She'll never travel anywhere without her bread. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Even comes to the hotel with a loaf of her own bread. Okay. All right, let's pan that one up. Pull. In there, there will be... Um, it's, the, it's the... Frederick, is the, um, the nutrition... The food lectin kit in there. Could you find the food lectin kit there and get me wheat out? So I'm going to test you with ordinary wheat, all right? We'll go out there. Julie, are there any biscuits or cakes or anything out there? Could you bring something in? So we're going to test you to see whether you are sensitive in that way. So remember, if something is really primary or priority, it will weaken all over, OK? Not just one leg. If one leg weakens and the other leg doesn't, this is a result of a problem. This is not the real problem. The real core of the problem has to universally weaken. It'll be down here somewhere. OK, so this is just wheat. Now, most of the flour that you buy in the shop is months. 
And from what I can gather, it can be years old. Oh, lovely. Okay, so this is wheat, okay? May, or basically it's wheat flour, this. This is not bread. Remember, we're not testing bread at this stage because bread's got other things in apart from wheat. So, pull. So the news is, he does weaken to wheat. Now, we don't have, you know, a comparison of white flour, brown flour, etc., etc., available at the moment here. So we take the wheat off him, okay? And now we put on Jill's bread, okay? The only difference with Jill's bread is this was made two days ago from milled. It was milled in her mill and made two days ago. Pull. So not only does that not weaken, now have you got any problems? Tell us your problems. <laughs> <laughs> You get bloated in the tummy, yeah. Okay. Um, Any pains? Anyway? Joints. Yeah. Joints. Where? Where? Thumbs. Thumbs. Good. No, I don't mean good for you. Okay. So therapy localized. Grip round a thumb joint somewhere. Okay. Okay. We're well, just with your thumb and your index finger. So w w pain is always a good marker, isn't it? Okay. Paul. Okay. So he's weak. Okay. So let's test here. So his thumbs are primary problems, okay? He's got inflammation in his thumbs, okay? So let's put on the wheat flour. We know he weakens to it, and he certainly doesn't strengthen to it. But Jill's bread. <laughs> Paul, how do you like Jill's bread? Yeah, yeah pretty good, eh? Paul? <laughs> so not only does this not weaken, it strengthens. So there's things in here which you don't get in ordinary bread, okay? So what could it be? Is it? Is what? Vitamin E, yeah, exactly. It's vitamin E, and it's different vitamin Bs. Now, the white flour doesn't have the vitamin E in it. It doesn't have the wheat germ, so it doesn't have the vitamin E. And it also doesn't have the vitamin Bs, okay? So it's pretty useless. It's just pure starch, basically, which eventually will drain you of your vitamin Bs, of which you need to create energy in the Krebs cycle. You need all the vitamin Bs. So eating white bread won't kill you, but it won't do you much good. And in fact, it will deplete you over a period of time, which is why arthritis and things, if you remember in the update with Pottinger's cats, and you see with cats and dogs, you develop arthritis. Once you start taking them on a pasteurized milk and cooked diet and white bread, white flour, okay? So these are the bad things. But wholemeal could be even worse. Wholemeal will give you the bees, which is great, but you're then taking the rancid oils in, which is stiffening up your cell membranes and not allowing your calcium and things to get into your heart tissue, and so on. So what are the two evils? This is what the guy found, Dr. Morgan, is that actually white flour is better for you. You're less likely to die. You will die, but you're less likely to die. But had those dogs had Jill's bread, it would have been different, okay? Now there's something else in Jill's bread over and above the E, or not over and above, but in addition to that, and that is vitamin B4, okay? B4, now you, most of you have heard me talk about B4 before. <laughs> okay, B4 is otherwise known as adenine, and it's used in emergency departments for regulating arrhythmias in the heart. So when people get arrhythmia and fibrillation, they inject them with adenine, or its derivative adenosine, and it steadies it. Now, question is, why does it do that? Okay. We know that the irregularity is caused by an irregularity in the firing in the pacemaker or the nerves that are going down to the bundle of Hiss there. Okay. So it's the antiarrhythmic vitamin. Okay. Now, it's not called vitamin B4 anymore because when it was discovered what it is, the body makes it. So if you look at how the body makes it, it makes it from various amino acids and it needs folic acid and all the usual things to make it. But it lost its status as far as being a vitamin because it wasn't necessary to get it from your diet. So a true vitamin or vital amine has to be got only from your food. You can't manufacture or synthesize by bacteria or internally. So adenine was forgotten about. And the richest source of adenine is yeast, which of course you put into your bread and the whole grain cereal. So those two are the main thing. And this is what bread is. It's yeast and whole grain cereal, which is freshly milled. Okay? So the only place you can buy this is at Sam's and at Jill's. Okay. 
okay, unless you've got a mill and you can make this yourself, which we highly recommend. Because once you tried the bread, or fresh bread, you won't go back to, mother, um, to other breads. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Absolutely. They've grown grains from the pyramids. Jill talked about the pyramids, and I like that party one. And then she said they put it into the pyramids for the pharaohs. And I thought, are they having parties inside there? <laughs> but they put wheat in there for the afterlife. And when they've explored some of the pyramids, they found tanks of grain in there. They've taken them out, and they've grown them 5,000 years later. And that's what the uh, camelt is. Is it camelt? Yeah. It's the camelt wheat. And the odd thing about camel wheat is they found it's much higher in selenium than modern wheats. And they know that selenium is a really important trace mineral, particularly in an organic form. So when you have selenium and you have it from a rich source in its organically bound form, it's already converted into its activated form, which is selenium cysteine, and not selenium as a, as a synthetic or as a, as a salt. <coughs> So if we could get camelt, which is beginning to come back into popularity, unfortunately by camelt flour, but you don't know how old it is, mm. but you need camelt as the grain. It is available in Germany, isn't it, Frederick? Um, yeah, but, yeah. You buy flour, but not the grain, I don't think. You can buy the grain? If you know where to go, you can buy it. If you know where to go. <laughs> yes, that's to the pyramids. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually it's a whole grain shop. It's a whole grain shop. A whole, a whole food store. Yes, if you can get a whole food store, and is. I highly recommend camut, spelt. These have simpler um, chromosome numbers, and so there's less, less coding for, more, for proteins. Modern wheat has a lot of chromosomes, and therefore a lot of proteins in it, and this is thought to be what people are sensitive to. In addition, that's what bloats people up. But you stick with, if you want to eat bread, then you eat whole grain, freshly milled. And you'll be not only tolerant, but it strengthens you and will get rid of this. Okay? It won't create it. It's modern disease, modern wheats that will create the problem. Okay? And this is what we're seeing increasing numbers, isn't it, of people who are sensitive to modern foods and to wheat because they've changed. Genetically, they're very much more complex. Okay. That's, thank you. Mm. So this heart protective group is definitely the E and probably um, the vitamin B4 and maybe other nutrients in there as well. So we're just finishing. When a cardiac crisis appears as evidenced by precordial pain, <coughs> palpitations, breathlessness, cyanosis, prompt action is necessary. Symptoms are identical, interestingly, to beriberi. Okay? This is vitamin B1 deficiency. However, in beriberi cases, the administration of thiamine did not relieve the symptoms of the paralysis. This was only relieved by the administration of an alcoholic extract of rice polishings. Remember where beriberi came from? It was in the east because they used polished rice, wasn't it? That's how we discovered about it. So if you give them the polished rice, the polishings, which is the bran, it gets rid of the beriberi symptoms, but thiamine doesn't. It follows that there's some substance in the extract which exerts a direct and immediate action on the heart. Prolonged acetylcholine administration will consistently cause coronary disease. Ah, acetylcholine, that's parasympathetic, isn't it? That's what I said this morning. This is different. This is vagus. Too much vagus, too much acetylcholine narrows the coronary vessels uh, in the experimental animals. Acetylcholine is produced at the myoneural junction of the coronary vessels, causing the arterial muscles to contract. After activation, acetylcholine is metabolized by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. Okay? So when we make acetylcholine, we then have to get rid of it, otherwise the, the muscle will continue to be contracted. Nervous strains and shock increase the production of acetylcholine. Nervous strain and shock. Could that be the anger and sustained rage that they've been talking about? Maybe. And is detrimental to the angina and coronary case. General atherosclerosis has been produced clinically by the administration of acetylcholine when tried for its remedial action on arthritis. The coronary artery is the most worked artery in the body. Worth remembering that, isn't it? It's the most worked artery in the body because it's constantly being squeezed, relaxed, squeezed, relaxed in the body, especially as a consequence of emotional and exercise. And is often the first to be sclerosed, in other words, hardened up. Now, the last bit, which is the real key, of course, is acetylcholinesterase is cofactored by vitamin B2 and B3. What do they do? They're vasodilators, aren't they? Okay. Where do you get these? Whole grain cereals and yeast. 
market, they're the prime suppliers of vitamin Bs, but particularly B1, B2, B3, B4, and to some extent B6 as well. So wholemeal bread will supply you these things, as long as it's fresh. Okay?